had a very nice run for the better part of two months. As Wall Street got accustomed to the idea that the Fed might be able to beat inflation without totally wrecking the entire economy, you know, I have not given up on that thesis. But this week, though, we've given up some of those gains, in large part because last Friday we got that red-hot employment or didn't fit the thesis, right, of the soft landing, suggests the Fed needed to continue to bring the pain. Honestly, it almost feels like we reassess Jay Powell's potential next move on a daily basis based on very limited data. But that's the market we're stuck with. And suddenly our collective assessment got a lot more negative in the last 48 hours. I think it's very difficult to get a clear read on the situation. Fundamentals are murky, right? That's why I like to fall back on something clinical. I like to fall on the technicians for some guidance based on a quantitative view of the current situation, not a qualitative one, not touchy-feely. So tonight we're going off the charts with the help of Jessica Inskip. She is a brilliant technician. You know, she was the first woman on the active trader desk at Fidelity before becoming the director of advanced t- uh, trader strategy at Merrill Self Direct. Now she's the director of product and options education at Options Play. But she still consults with all the major brokerage firms in self-directed space and helps us here, too. Plus, you can see her every Thursday on Friday, Thursday on Fidelity's weekly options trading show, In the Money. Now, a few weeks ago, Inskip told us that the market's recent run could have legs. She said it would go through mid-December. But now that mid-December's sneaking up on us, she's feeling a lot, more, a lot less constructive, a lot more concerned. And just to be sure, as you know, we did catch a great rally with her. That's what really matters to me. Why? Why is she getting a little more concerned after this terrific, nice run? Well, you've got to take a look at this. This is a picture of a market that's hostage to the Fed. And the Fed's hostage to the labor market, which is currently way too hot, as we know from last Friday. Inskip sees the whole advance from mid-October through the end of last week as, yes, a bear market rally, a temporary bounce within a larger downtrend. Once we got that overheated non-farm payroll report last Friday, the S&P 500 stalled out at two ceilings of resistance, and these were very key levels. S&P 500 right here. It's 200-day moving average. 200 is the SMA. Okay. And the, uh, it's downward sloping trend line. And that's going back uh, to the peak last year. This is a key hurdle the market had to jump. And sadly, well, we obviously failed to clear it. We failed. Okay. We failed. On top of that, check out these yellow lines above and below the price action. These are known as Bollinger Bands. They're a visual representation of volatility in a given security. As it gets more volatile, the bands expand. As it gets less volatile, the bands shrink. This way, the, the way this works, the price action should stay within the bands roughly 90% of the time. Or in statistical terms, the bands show you where a security can go if it hits two standard deviations from its 50-day moving average. Inskip points out that over the past year, bear market rallies tend to run out of steam when they get two standard deviations away from this key moving average. And that's almost exactly where the S&P 500 went at its highs on Friday. Two standard deviations. Remember, these are the yellow lines that we care about, all right? Every time the S&P gets near that top Bollinger Band, well, guess what? It peaks. Right there. Of course, that's a temporary pattern. It's not going to hold forever. But when the S&P failed to break out above that key ceiling of resistance, Inskip thinks we went right back into bear market mode. The S&P can still escape from this new trajectory, but she won't have much confidence in a bounce unless we blow through last Friday's levels. Possible, but you know what? Certainly didn't feel like probable today. However, just because Inskip's feeling more cautious about the S&P, that doesn't mean she's more, more negative about everything else. Sure, if you're, real, if you're worried solely about the Fed strangling the life of the economy, then last week's labor report number was not encouraging. When you drill down into the job openings data, though, you get some real insight into the industries that are still booming and may keep booming even if the Fed stays hawkish. Now, we know, for instance, there's a travel boom fueling demand for new airplanes. And sure enough, aerospace manufacturing jobs were up 6% year over year and still climbing month over month. Plus, you've got all the Fed infrastructure spending kick in next year. Suddenly, it'll be a huge boon for, the, for tons of industrial ch- uh, stocks. So I want you to do this. I want you to check out the chart of the S&P 500 Industrial Sector Index, okay? This is the relative to the performance of the broader S&P 500 that you're looking at. 
The, this industrial sub-index contains both infrastructure and aerospace plays. And Skip points out that the S&P industrials have broken out in recent weeks, surging above the resistance zone of the recent trading range. That tells her the industrials should keep outperforming the broader market. See, even though it's run a lot, and you may think, well, wait a second, doesn't have to rest or go down. She says this relative strength is incredible news. Well, the S&P failed to clear the hurdle. The S&P industrials, they pulled it off. You know how much I like the industrials. I talk about them constantly. By the way, I, talk, I have this mid-morning, I don't know if you ever watch my morning meeting, but I do this thing at 10, 20, and I talk about the industrials almost every day, but it's only for uh, investing club members. Now, if you want to pick one stock that's industrial in here, I almost, oh, shoot, I didn't want to show you because everybody hates this stock. It's General Electric. This is relative to the rest of the industries. Remember, 20% of GE's business comes down to aerospace, and their energy business is finally back to life. And that's, you know, think about it as windmills. That's not oil and gas anymore. We saw the S&P 500 fail to break out above its downward sloping trend line, a crucial ceiling of resistance. Well, GE busted through that ceiling like the Kool-Aid man. Inskip thinks that's tremendous relative performance. She likes what that says about GE's future. Now, remember, GE's breaking up. Uh, it's going to be a big healthcare division. A lot of people talking about it. Coming out from another angle, take a look at the action in GE in comparison to some crucial Fibonacci levels. Fibonacci levels, what are this? Okay, remember, chartists love to measure past swings to a given stock and then run them through the prism of Fibonacci ratios to kind of find key levels where that stock's likely to change its trajectory. After its recent run, GE is now stalling around the 50% retracement. Well, eh, okay, up from the decline from the highs in December of last year. Uh, through the lows this July. Given its relative outperformance, it gives Betty it can push through this. And if that happens, it could go all the way to 94 before hitting the next ceiling. Wouldn't that be incredible? It'd be starting to go back to where it was when they announced the breakup, which nobody seemed to like. I thought it made a lot of sense. Plus, it sure doesn't hurt that GE is now trading above its 200-day moving average. We always care about stocks above 200-day. Not many of them right now. It's hard to find. Here's the bottom line. The charts as interpreted by Jessica Inskip suggest that the broader market might be in for a bumpy ride as we exit bear market rally mode, but she still likes the industrials in, gen in general, and she likes General Lich in particular, GE. Hey, you know what? I think she's got a point. I like the GE restructuring. Again, I particularly like the healthcare business and the aerospace. Let's take phone calls. Let's go to Joe in my home state of New Jersey. Joe. Hello, Mr. Kramer. Thank you Joe. for having me on. Good to have you back. What's up? Yes. Um, my stock is 3M. Uh, with the low P.E., off its highs, and a nice dividend, is 3M a buy? It is really a quandary to me. You know, they're also thinking about spinning off a division I really like. What I worry about here is even though they are dividend aristocrat, I don't like all the lawsuits that they're getting, whether it be the tinnitus lawsuits. I have terrible tinnitus myself, although I'm working on a drug to try to, to try to at least stabilize it. And I don't like any groundwater lawsuits, and they've got those two. So I am concerned about those two pieces of business, and that has kept me from the stock for 100 points. Right? The charts, as interpreted by the terrific Jessica Inskip, suggest that the broader market might be in for a bumpy ride. But she still likes the industrials. And the one she likes in particular is General Electric. And I think she's got a point. I think Larry Culp is doing a great job. And he is not appreciated for the work he's doing. How much more may have money at? Hey, you called me on the super microcomputer. I, I, it, it, I didn't remember it. I can't remember everything. I, got, I mean, I got a lot of stuff going on here, yeah? So I want to do a little more work. And tonight I'm turning in my homework on this tech stock. It's kind of interesting. Then, guess who's birthday? Happy birthday to you, Dogecoin. And to celebrate, I'm issuing, well, let's just say a uh, something less than a present about the once hot crypto coin. And I think you're going to want to hear it. Quickly, if you own it, then you can really, really rethink your view of me. And all your calls, rapid fire, tonight's edition of the Lightning Round. So stay with Kramer.